Hey everyone, this is another exercise science review. Just want to say if you enjoy this video, uh, please like and subscribe for future videos. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how these kind of breaking two hour projects have been trying to beat this two hour physiological marathon limit. And we're going to talk a little bit about how changes in running economy are really what they're trying to manipulate. So with that in mind, let's get started. So let's take a quick look at the actual current marathon records. Uh, so the first being the actual uh, current marathon world record set by Elliot Kipchoge uh, just recently. And that was in two hours, one minute and 39 seconds, which is an approximately four minute and 39 second mile. Then we have the uh, Nike Breaking 2 project where Elliot Kipchoge ran a marathon in two hours and 25 seconds, which is an approximately four minute and 36 per second mile pace. And then we have this kind of two uh, hour barrier, which would require a four minute, 35 second per mile pace. So again, there are differences uh, between the Nike breaking two and the actual race. And we'll kind of talk about how uh, these differences, these breaking two projects are using changes in running economy as opposed to uh, significant changes in the physiology of the runners to hopefully break this two hour milestone. So to get under the two hour marathon uh, in an actual race, uh, there needs to be an increase in uh, running performance of about 1.4%. Um, and this SUSA 2018 review is kind of interesting. I'll uh, leave it in the links down below, uh, but essentially it talks about how uh, far and kind of what are the factors that matter in terms of breaking this two hour marathon in an actual marathon. And so the first one being a genetic pool. So this just comes based off of uh, really your genetics, where you grew up, where you live, um, kind of your inherent ability. Then the tactical aspects of it, it really uh, partly depends on how well you're drafting and how well uh, you're pacing throughout the marathon. Then it shows a look at uh, the physiological factors. So we'll get into these a little bit more in a second, but uh, about 25% is based off of someone's VO2 max, 35% based on lactate threshold, and about 40%, so the greatest percent based off of running economy. And then finally, we have the biomechanical uh, aspects of this, which are the balance of your muscles, how much uh, kind of uh, cost is associated with your balance, the type of leg swing you have, uh, your braking force, um, and then especially the kind of most significant factors are your body weight and your forward propulsion and the uh, air resistance that you're experiencing. So if you're a runner, you've probably heard of VO2 max. Uh, this is an indication of someone's maximal oxygen uptake and consumption. Uh, in terms of cars, you can kind of think of uh, their top speed or like the full capacity. So this is kind of like the upper limit that someone can achieve. Uh, it doesn't actually, it is important for uh, long distance running, but it isn't actually as big of an indicator of success on a lot of these distance and longer distance runs as you might think. So the next physiological factor is anaerobic ventilatory threshold. Um, so this is really the percent of VO2 max you can um, maintain aerobically. And once you pass over this threshold, your body has to essentially go into anaerobic um, metabolism, which will cause a buildup of metabolites and lactate, which causes that kind of burn that you experience when you're exercising. So this is like the percent of that VO2 max where you uh, aren't breaking down and you could, could potentially hold forever. So then we have running economy, which essentially just determines the VO2, um, so how much oxygen you need to consume at a specific race pace. So think of this as your MPGs, so um, how efficient you are at running at certain paces. If you think about it, someone with a very high VO2 but really crappy running economy can't really do much with that uh, because essentially you can't hold, uh, or that VO2 max is going to be associated with a pretty low speed. However, someone with a relatively low VO2 but really good running economy will actually outperform. So uh, in terms of factors that are kind of being focused on for a lot of these breaking two projects, uh, in terms of an actual marathon, we tend to think of 
physiological training, like going out and running and the type of training that the individual does to improve things like VO2, anaerobic threshold, and running economy. However, with these breaking two projects, not only are uh, Kipchoge and some of the other participants focusing on these aspects, but the race is trying to manipulate certain factors to improve things like running economy. So let's talk a little bit about what they're improving and why it matters. So again, we need to run approximately 1.4% faster than what uh, Elliot is doing uh, at the top in an actual race right now. So we could improve things like VO2 max, um, lactate threshold, um, and running economy, uh, but how do we really improve these things? So there is training, but obviously uh, Elliot is kind of training the best way he can and he keeps improving and that's great. However, these you know two hour projects are trying to focus on things like conditions and gear to kind of get him over the hump and get him past that two hour barrier. So really the thing that they're trying to do is improve uh, Elliot's running economy. And this can be done through a lot of running itself. So his running economy uh, inherently is very good. However, um, they're going to try to improve his running economy based off kind of artificial and other factors that uh, they can manipulate. However, something that's kind of interesting is uh, your running economy matters a lot, especially at these lower uh, velocities. However, as you get faster, improving your running economy gives you more marginal and marginal gains. So that's why it's so hard, even though the uh, pace of the marathon has been getting lower and lower as we get uh, faster and faster and better technology. However, we're getting, you know, we're seeing a 6% increase in velocity as we get faster and faster throughout the marathon, while we were getting much bigger changes based off improvements in running economy at these lower paces. So even though uh, we can kind of keep betting, getting better and better at running economy, there is a physiological kind of uh, barrier to our improvement. So what are the biomechanical factors that relate to one's running economy? So the biggest kind of thing that you can think of is supporting one's body weight, which takes up approximately 74% of our overall running economy. And as you might expect, that's not really somewhere where a lot of these um, athletes are able to improve a lot. If you look at Kipchoge, he doesn't necessarily have a ton of weight to lose. And one of the ways that he could potentially lose weight during race day is something like dehydration. However, that would hinder his other physiological uh, kind of important factors for the race. So really changing body weight factors isn't super beneficial for the elite endurance athletes that we're trying to get over this two hour hump. They've already kind of optimized that concept. So then we have forward propulsion. As you can see, it's only 6% of running economy, but this is somewhere uh, that we can really improve, or uh, Ineos and Nike it can really improve compared to a regular marathon. So we'll get into this a little bit. So in terms of uh, forward propulsion, uh, our forward propulsion, in order to maintain a certain velocity, we have to have acceleration equal zero, which means our forward propulsion has to equal the air resistance that we're experiencing. Um, and something that can really reduce the amount of air resistance force is drafting. As you can see here, if you're drafting from one meter behind someone, it drops the amount of air resistance by like 93%. So that's uh, here. 93% shielding um, and 0% shielding, you'd be back here on the velocity curve in terms of your gross VO2. So as you can see here, he's running at a slower pace than over here. However, his actual uh, VO2 is even kind of, uh, is comparable for the same speed. And as you can see here, you get a 10 mile per hour tailwind, you got a lead runner. However, if you got no wind and you got a lead runner, you can kind of improve and optimize uh, the amount of wind resistance. And then if you do have a headwind, again, you can still have uh, this kind of uh, barrier or this drafting to improve your running efficiency. However, uh, this is a huge kind of point of improving running economy. As you can see in these projects, uh, they have Elliot in some very tight drafting formations, and this really helps improve his time. Um, over what you could do in an actual marathon where you're not really allowed to have uh, this drafting for the entire race. So then another kind of small tangent, what about uh, leg swing and kind of leg weight? So if you have a more distal 
uh, leg swing, this is related to greater metabolic cost. So you want kind of a short uh, leg swing. And another kind of factor that leads into this is the East African slender calves. Uh, so if you uh, aren't from that area, you may have uh, kind of bigger, thicker calves, kind of like I do. And this adds weight and adds kind of torque, which is harder for your body to move and more costly. So theoretically, if you were to replace the lower leg with carbon fiber, uh, you would see a 12% decrease in metabolic cost. One, this isn't feasible because no one wants to be losing their leg. However, um, even physiologically, uh, this is kind of a nice case study, that lower amputees, uh, lower leg amputees kind of at the same level aren't as economical as other individuals, even though they have this kind of weight improvement. And we'll kind of get into why this might be. So again, uh, amputee sprinters do not have improved running economy. And one of the main reasons for this being, even though they have this kind of uh, this leg swing that is more optimized and their weight may be a little bit lower, uh, their running economy is worse. And this is predominantly because even though they lose all that weight, that weight was active muscle. So even though the prosthetic is there, it's actually going to um, it's going to be dead weight, so you don't have any muscle allowing you to produce force. So now we have uh, the idea of a hilly course. So a lot of marathons, in order to break a record, you have to have a somewhat uh, similar start and end elevation so that it's kind of a net no change race. Uh, however, hills on a course will spike things like lactate. So this is a study that looked at running at 0% grade, 2% um, grade, and then 7% grade. Uh, and as you can see, their heart rate uh, during the 2% grade and the 7% grade were jacked up and their VO2 as well as their lactate buildup were jacked up during uh, the increases in the uh, hill and elevation during the course. So this is something that uh, Kipchoge and this kind of race director for the INEOS project are really trying to improve is a super flat course so that he doesn't get these spikes in lactate and can hopefully uh, maintain this pace uh, of the two hours. And this is something that Elliot himself really said that he wanted because he knows that it's important uh, to minimize the amount of hills that he has to go uh, up and over. And so then there's kind of this whole thing of shoe design, and I don't want to get into this too much because it's not really the focus of uh, Ineos project, however, it was really the focus of the Nike 2 project. They were really trying to sell you on these shoes. But this idea of shoe weight, so a 100 gram uh, change in the weight of the shoe is supposedly going to give you a 1% uh, improvement in running economy. However, barefoot running, uh, you don't see an improvement in running economy. So why might this be? There's this whole cushioning hypothesis, and that's the idea that your active muscles uh, need to cushion your body as opposed to the shoe cushioning for you. So really you kind of spend up that boost in running economy you get based off of weight. So again, uh, these uh, different types of shoes, uh, reduce weight to 100 grams, maintain cushioning properties, um, so you can allow for improved marathons. So this was a study that was looking at Kometo's um, marathon pace and how uh, running shoe weight might improve this. Then there's the idea of the kind of compliance of the shoe and the fiber midsole, so increased bending stiffness enhances running economy. Uh, there's kind of an optimal range. This can improve uh, running economy. However, uh, this study found that it only improved running economy in certain individuals. So if this kind of uh, stiffness improved your specific running economy, yeah, you'd see that bump. However, there are individuals where it actually hurt their running economy. So again, all that to say that uh, some of the studies that have been done uh, looking at shoe optimization, all that stuff, are uh, kind of flawed. And you'll see why uh, in my kind of conclusion. So this is a look at the study that compared Nike shoes to the Adidas shoes and um, more metabolically, uh, or sorry, weight uh, balance shoes. However, uh, even though you kind of see this Nike shoe being better, something to keep in mind is that 
So as you can see, uh, these studies were done in sub-elite runners running at slower velocities than what's required for the sub two hour marathon. So it doesn't translate directly, again, because of, uh, as we said, as we get faster, the improvements in running economy don't translate in the same degree of improvement in pace. Um, so therefore, it's really gonna be tight with all this running economy. That's why they're trying to optimize everything because as we get closer and closer and faster and faster, we really really see um, these physiological changes and tweaks giving us much more marginal uh, changes in pace. So that is all. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, again, please like and subscribe um, and leave a comment down below of what you think, of what you think of breaking the two-hour project. If uh, Elliot does finish, then also leave a comment of what you thought of the race. I'm sure I'll be uh, watching, but uh, that's all for now. And uh, I'll talk to you later with a new video next week. All right. Please take a look at some of my previous videos uh, shown here uh, down below.